well, we're going to uh, be thinking about God. To him be the glory. And uh, our text is 11, Romans 11, verse 36. But I want to start by posing a question to you, first of all. And it is this. Do you know God? Do you know God uh, this, this evening? Of course, perhaps you might say something like this. Of course I know God. <laughs> but let me come back with another question. Do you really know God? You may say, well, I know about him. And, and perhaps this time of year you might say, I know about what happened in Bethlehem. I know about Mary and Joseph and uh, Mary riding on the donkey and the stable and all that. And we can, perhaps you might say, well, I know all about Jesus being a great teacher, a prophet. I know about Jesus dying on the cross. And you might say, well, I know of him. But do you know him? You might say, well, I know something about Jesus. Prayerfully, you might be able to say, well, I've got a personal relationship with Jesus. But we can never, ever really say, can we, that we know someone. We can know quite a bit about somebody, but we'll never know, for example, we'll never know somebody as well as a wife might know a husband or a mother, her child. And we can know God. God enables us to know something of him. But we can't fully know God. And the reason why we can't fully know God is because God is infinite. God is much bigger than his creation. We can't say, well, I've, I've read this book and I, can, I, I know all that God, all about God, who he is. You can never say that because God is much bigger than we could ever think, ever imagine, because God is bigger than his creation, isn't he? And we are not infinite. We are finite beings. We can only store so much in our understanding and our knowledge because we're not God. And Romans 11 begins to tell us a, a little about the bigness of God. Romans 11, verse 33 and verse 34. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. And Paul goes on to say, for who has known the mind of the Lord or who has become his counselor? Well, nobody knows the mind of God. Nobody can be the counsel of God because God is so big, so infinite. Well, I pray this, this evening will perhaps happen to us is this, that we'll be thinking more about God when we leave this building this morning, uh, this evening. And that perhaps even our thinking might change a little uh, about God. And that's why we're going to, <clears throat> going to this text of Romans 11, verse uh, 36, called, Of him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. But let's first put this text in a, kind of, in a context. Uh, the end of Romans chapter 11, our text, uh, is a kind of benediction. Uh, Paul has sort of, as it were, draw, uh, drawing a line under what he said in the previous chapters. Because the previous chapters were all about his teaching about who Jesus really is and, and justification by faith and, uh, and uh, all the things about God and how God has been dealing with the Jewish people and how God has brought Gentiles in, unto salvation. Uh, and the next chapters are about how you supposed to, should be walking with the Lord, how you should be growing in faith. And he's kind of drawing a line under there, and he's almost come to the point where he started off <laughs> way back in chapter 1. And he's come to the end of chapter 11, and he's, he's talked about the amazing thing that God is, has done, and for him as a Jew, 
you know, he's in his thinking, he, he has thought of himself that uh, Israel, the Jews, were the, the, the special people of God. But God amazingly has brought Gentiles into the kingdom. And it isn't about works. He makes a big discussion about that, doesn't he? Uh, in the early chapters of Romans. It isn't about works, it's about faith. It's about believing. And he comes to this point as if he's come to this statement of saying, this is incredible. This is, this is something I would never ever, as a, a Pharisee, before I met Jesus, I would never ever work this all out. And, and the world can't work it out. And so he has this, this sense in which he's so full of his language, talking about how, well, how amazing, how wonderful. Uh, verse 34, who has known the mind of the Lord? Who could have worked this out? Who has become his counselor? He's telling us here about the, in, the incomprehensibility of God and his wisdom. So we're going to look at verse uh, 36 and, uh, of Romans 11. And we're going to go f through this a little bit by bit. And so the first point is this, of him. There's two words, of him. And perhaps we need to throw out that text again in case you've... You, by the time, you've, uh, by the time you've, you've left this building, you will probably know this verse very well. Romans 11, verse 36. <coughs> For of him and through him and to him are all things. So we're going to be thinking of, of him. I did think uh, this evening of bringing in a wooden chair. But I thought if I did that and I stuck it by there, you'd all be saying, what's that wooden chair doing? And you wouldn't, you wouldn't be thinking about singing the hymns or the prayer or the reading. You'd be thinking about that wooden chair. But what I want you to do th this evening is to think of a wooden chair. And I want, oh, well, let's, let, let's make it even better. Let's think of a wooden armchair, okay? Who made the wooden armchair? That's a rhetorical question, so I'm not expecting an answer. Um, who made the wooden chair? You might have a number of answers to that, but I'll tell you who made the wooden chair. God made the wooden chair. Well, how did God make the wooden chair? Well, first of all, he created trees, didn't he? All those tens of thousands of years ago, he created trees. And then he caused those trees to reproduce to have more trees. And then there came a point when there was a tree which the wood was suitable to make an armchair. And God gave skill to someone to look at that tree and to look at the wood of the tree and say, that is going to make an armchair. And he gave skill, perhaps to another person, to be able to treat the wood in such a way that they could bend to the wood in such a way and uh, saw the wood in such a way to produce the chair. And then God, perhaps, perhaps you're going to buy this chair. God gave you the money to buy that chair. And hopefully he's given you the health to sit in that chair and enjoy that chair. So when you start thinking like that, you realize that that chair, I know it's an invisible chair over there, but that chair is God's chair. He has given it to you for your comfort. God made it, as it were. And that reminds us of the fact that God, and by this I'm thinking in terms of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit here, is the source of all things, because he has created all things. And let me just throw one text up here. It speaks about Jesus, I know, but remember the, uh, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the three are one. And so we can read John, 1 John 3 and say this, all things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. That's something worth 
meditating on and pondering on, on isn't it, in our lives. Everything in our, in our world proceeds from God and is from the mind of God. Because right at the very beginning, and we can go to Genesis 1, and we can hear God speaking out loud, let there be. And there was. It was all from the mind of God. Let there be light. Let there be sun. Let there be moon. Let there be stars. Let there be earth. Let there be sea. Let there be animals. Let there be fish. Let there be birds. Let us make man in, in our own image. It's all come from God. It's all come from the mind of God. So we say, as Paul does here, Romans 11, verse 36, that it's of him. But it's also, second, secondly, through him. Through him. I'll throw up that verse again. For of him and through him and to him are all things. I came across a statement that uh, stopped me uh, in my tracks uh, this last week. It was from one of, one of the Puritans I was reading, and it said this, raindrops do not come from, do not, sorry, raindrops do not cause grass to grow. And my first reaction was, of course it does. But what he was trying to tell us was this. God causes the grass to grow. He gives the raindrops. God has not only created all things, but God has sustained all things. He is the very reason why the planets uh, still orbit around the sun, uh, why uh, the galaxy, galaxies exist, why we have the the winter and the summer and the autumn and the spring. He's the very reason why human beings are still on planet Earth. The very reason why there is oxygen. All those things are because God is sustaining all those things. So let's read Colossians chapter 1 and just two verses. 16 and 17, which we've read already uh, this evening. Again, it's talking about Jesus, but we think of Jesus in terms of the Trinity, uh, the Godhead. For by him and all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. I've done a bit of reading this week. I don't know why, but this week was a very good week for reading. And I was reading Charles Spurgeon. And uh, Charles Spurgeon was a great... Baptist preacher of the 19th century, and he was he was having a, preaching a sermon, and he was he was I, I I got the impression that he must have looked down a microscope because he was talking about the wonders of heaven, and then he said, "But look, if you look from your microscope, you can see the wonders so small, so minute, we can't see them, but God has created them all, and he he has, hasn't he?" And he just stains the, the, largest of the largest of galaxies and the smallest of microbes. And, of course, in the 21st century, you might say the, the molecules and even the atoms that you can see in your electron microscopes as well. Thomas Boston is another Puritan. <laughs> we mentioned him on Wednesday in our Bible study. He's a Scottish Presbyterian. And he... I, I, he was a pastor of a very rural church, so lots of his illustrations come from what he was seeing going out into the fields. And he made this statement in a sermon once. Each pile of grass speaks of God who is wise, good, and powerful. Because God has, God has made the grass. And he's talking at a time of, of harvest. 
the, the gathering of the goods, the, the grass being collected up for the, for the winter cattle. Each pile of grass, he says, speaks of God who is wise, good, and powerful. God has sustained life. He sustains us. He sustains the cattle in the fields. The very creation declares the glory of God. Even a pile of grass. And that's what the psalmist David said. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament, the, the sky, the night sky, shows his handiwork. So things are of him, and they're through him. And so you can gather what the third point's going to be, and that is to him. To him. And Romans 11, verse 36 says, again, for of him and through him and to him are all things. When you read the Bible, you discover that God is not only the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God. But you also discover he's also the end. He is the last end of all things. All will come back to God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. And in the end of all things, all glory will, I'm going to use, <laughs> I'm going to use an old word here, all glory will redound to him. That's, which is sort of like theologians speak to say everything will be overflowing with glory to God. The heavens will declare the glory of God. Every created being at the end of time will be declaring the glory of God. Uh, to God only be the glory given. Uh, that word redound uh, means some kind of overabundance and exuberance of glory that's going to come uh, to, to God. And uh, Romans 11 and verse 30, 36 tells us that. The glory of all created things will not only be given back to God, but because of his working in this, will there be, in a sense, even more glory going back to God? As creation, we ourselves will bring glory, as, uh, we ourselves as believers will bring glory in Jesus to God. It's all going to come back to him because he is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. But that brings us to a more practical point, and it's this. We must know God. We must know God. If God is the infinite God, the God who has created all things, the God who sustains all things, he, he sustains our very life, our very existence, the existence of this earth in which we live. We need to know God. And God wants us to know himself. And one of the reasons why I can tell you that God wants us to know about him is that he's given us a book. He's given us his word, hasn't he? He's given us the Bible. And we must know about God in order to know God more. Ours, if we know and love the Lord Jesus Christ, ours must be a growing knowing of God. Well, how can we know God more? How can each day, uh, can we desire to know God more? How can we cultivate more of God in our lives? Well, I'm going to give you a few things to, to think about. And the first is this, knowledge. Knowledge. Where do you know God? Where can you know God? The answer is the scriptures, isn't it? The answer is his, his book. He wrote it for us. If you want to know about God, you need to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible, reread the Bible, reread the Bible. You, you, you can never read too much of the Bible. You, can, you, know, you should never stop reading the Bible. It doesn't matter how long you live. If you live to 120, you should still be reading the Bible. Because as 
you read the Bible, you discover there's so much more in the Bible that you hadn't seen before. And if we're walking close to the Lord, it will seem like a new book to us, again and again and again. God speaking to us through his word, through his spirit. But then, one thing I think that we sort of neglect, I remember hearing a, to some, to some of us, a, a well-known preacher, Stuart Olliot, who told us that he felt that this was the great neglect of the evangelical church, and that is, we don't meditate upon God's word. Now, we read it, we do our Bible readings, we might do our Robert Murray McShane readings, we're trying to get for the whole of the scriptures, but sometimes you just need to stop and sit down and look at a text, one verse perhaps, and ask questions. Why did God say it this way? What does that text mean? How can I take hold of that word and apply it to myself? Is it teaching me something? Is it saying something to me? If you don't like the word meditation, because <laughs> when I was a youngster, we had all these sort of um, Hindu uh, uh, gurus around the place, and I went off the word completely, meditation. If you don't like the word meditation, use the word ponder. Ponder on God's word. Just slow down sometimes when you read the word of God. And uh, take a, a few verses at a time and ask those questions. What is it really saying? What is this word telling me? What is God telling me? Here. And then you won't be surprised that my third point would be this. Pray. Pray for a closer walk and nearness to God. You know, in prayer, and it's right that we should be doing this, we should be giving thanks to God. We should be adoring God. We should uh, be come, come to God with our confessions, coming before God with our petitions. But sometimes we should also be praying that we might have a much closer relationship with God, that we might be more like Christ, that our nearness to God, uh, well, that we might grow nearer to God, you see, if you, if you want to know someone, and this won't be too much of a secret, but the secret to knowing someone is this. You need to spend time with them. To know God more, to grow closer to God, you need to spend time with God. You need to walk and you need to talk with God. Well, another point here is that you need fellowship. In fact, I've changed the heading in my own notes here and say this, we need fellowship with the family of God. We need fellowship with the family of God. You see, we're, we're finite people. We're not perfect Christians. There are um, things that are weaknesses and some things might be strengths with us. We're, our walk with the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is going to be different from somebody else's walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. We need each other so that we can be more balanced children of God. We need to talk about Jesus. We need to share the things of Christ and the things of God with others. We need to learn from one another. We need to support one another if perhaps one aspect of our walk with Jesus is a bit on the weak side. And so we can strengthen our weaker brothers and sisters and they can strengthen us because we've got our own weaknesses, because we are imperfect. We're not going to be perfect until we go to glory. So cultivate those relationships with God's people. And by doing so, rubbing shoulders with God's people, we will grow closer to God. And then the final thought is this, look. Look for him. In all that you do in life, as you live your life day by day, week by week, and year by year, look out for God's hand. See him with the eye of faith. You see, one of our problems is that when we, when we look, we just simply look at the physical things. 
If I can go back to the chair for a moment. You can, you can see a chair, a wooden chair, and the question was asked, wasn't it, who made this chair? Well, you would say, I would say, oh, it, it was made by a carpenter. It was made by a certain firm. Um, but to see with the eye of faith is to say, looking at that chair and say, God made that chair. Those bits of wood there were made by God. God created trees. God created the right, right kind of wood for the chair. God created the material that's on the chair. The right kind of material. God did it. We need to look past the physical world that everybody else in the world is looking at and see the handiwork of God in this. To see, to see God at work. <coughs> sometimes, of course, uh, it becomes pretty obvious. I don't know about you, but sometimes you go somewhere, well, uh, and you see, you see a sunset, or you see a sunrise. Well, perhaps it's easier then to say, well, God did this. But God does all kinds of things. He sustains all things, remember? He created all things. We need to cultivate the mindset of, of looking and thinking about God. Looking for what God has done. Thinking about what God is doing. We need to look, as Thomas Boston did, look beyond the pile of grass. So I'm going to quote Thomas Boston again. I'm going to, we're going to stay with grass. He had a lot to say about grass. But he says, he says this. Every pile of grass, every pile of grass, and he's probably had a lot of piles of grass as he's walking to church. Every pile of grass is a preacher to the loving kindness of God. It's God who caused the, the grass to grow, not the raindrops. It's God who has produced this pile of grass to sustain the animals for the winter. Every pile of grass is a preacher to the loving kindness of God. But it's not just a pile of grass, is it? Um, wonderfully, um, amazingly, really, in the fellowship here, we know of the birth of a new child. That is amazing, isn't it? That's wonderful. We know that's from God. And we can give, give God thanks. I mean, people outside, perhaps certain experts might say, well, you know, we know how babies are made. But God made that baby. That's God's child that we have in the church now. The life that we have in the body, the energy and strength to, that, that we have, the, the fact that, well, hopefully, we'll wake up tomorrow, tomorrow morning and be able to move our legs and arms and make ourselves a cup of tea. God has given us energy, that, that energy. God has given us that health. That God has given us that strength. I don't know if uh, you've got a car, but I tell you what I, I think sometimes, and I should think more often, is this, God gave me that car. God gave me enough money to purchase that car. That's God's car, not my car. It's only on loan. It's God's gift to me. And I can praise him for it. We've got to start thinking like that, haven't we? And not start thinking, well, this is my house, this is my car, this is my job, or whatever. It's what God has given to us. God has sustained us in. Everything, says the scriptures there. Everything, all things are of God and through God and to God. And to God means this. It means praising God. It means giving him the glory. It means thanking him for every day of our life. Because every day of our life, God is keeping us and sustaining us and preparing us. If we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we're on a journey. But on those days of the journey, God is shaping us and fashioning us and preparing us, making us ready to be with him and to enjoy him in eternity. Well, let's, let's thank God in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we...
want to give you praise and we want to give you thanks that the very world in which we live, you created. And the very world in which we sometimes think it just keeps on ticking on the same old way, but it, you are sustaining that. You're keeping the planets in orbit, you're making the sun to shine, the moon uh, to rise. You give us the very air that, that we have to breathe, you give us the very life in our bodies. Help us to see more clearly, more wonderfully, beyond the physical things of this world, to yourself and to the work of your hands, and to give you praise and to give you thanks, and to uh, rejoice in what you do give us and help us to realize that what we have here on earth is just something temporary. We'll have to give it all back one day. But we praise you and thank you that you've got for us, uh, uh, those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, a precious treasure which is eternal. And it is to be with you in heaven, to worship you with the angels of heaven, and to be there forever and ever. And so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.